climate change doesn't live on an island, we're all impacted by it. It's really not and shouldn't be a political issue. Climate One has ensured that indeed many, many different parties have seats at the table. Every mainstream religion has a mandate to care for creation. We all have a moral responsibility to the future. The way parents have a responsibility for their children. We all have children or relatives who are very young. Do we not want their world to be good too? Do we not see clearly that what we are doing is not sustainable? And if you do see that, and you continue to deny it for some political reasons, then this is a travesty. Kids are growing up now and there's absolutely no question on whether climate change is real, whether climate change is happening. And the question now instead is what should we do about it? The future of environmental activism is motivating young people to become civically engaged. Now more than ever, we need to come together as a culture and a society to address this really important issue. I am a supreme optimist. I do believe that we can transform ourselves. I do believe that we have the energy, ability, and courage somewhere inside of all of us to do what has to be done. Thanks for joining us for this live stream discussion of the visual dimensions of climate storytelling. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who inhabited these lands for 10,000 years. We'd love to hear from you today, so please share your questions in the comments of the live stream. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast that drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. I'm delighted to welcome three talented and highly accomplished artists who employ film and photography to chronicle human-caused climate change. Celine Cousteau is a filmmaker and explorer who knew her new documentary film, Tribes on the Edge, bears witness to indigenous communities in the Amazon that are fighting for their survival. Christina, Christina Miedemeyer is a photographer, a conservationist, and marine biologist. She founded the nonprofit Sea Legacy with her partner, the photographer Paul Nicklin. And Davis Guggenheim is a writer, director, and producer. His documentaries include the Academy Award-winning An Inconvenient Truth, he named me Malala and Waiting for Superman. Welcome to you all. It's an honor to be with you. Um, Celine, let's begin with you. One day a few years ago, you received an email from a man named Beto, who you met at a conference in the Amazon. Who is Beto and why did his plea for help reach you so deeply that you rearranged your life? <laughs> um, that's a good way of putting it, Greg, rearranged my life. I hadn't looked at it that way. Um, Beto is from the Marubo tribe um, in the Valle de Javari indigenous territory in the Brazilian Amazon. I was there in 2007 uh, filming a conference of the contacted indigenous people of that territory as part of a film called Return to the Amazon um, as we were going back to places my grandfather had been to in the early 80s. And when I was there, I, I bore witness to the stories of um, critical health issues, uh, hepatitis, malaria being two of them. Now COVID is added on top of that, that the indigenous people have been facing for decades, um, started with the colonizers in the 16th century. And I was heartbroken. I mean, we, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I tell stories, but I also watch stories and to be in the midst of it um, impacted me in a tremendous way. And I wanted to do more than, than just do that one film. It was years later that Beto sent me an email and he said, I want you to tell my people's story. I want the world to know we exist and we want to live. Um, and, and there's really, um, there's no other answer but yes. And yes, I rearranged my life to make this part of it. Um, that was in 2010. So it's now 11 years later um, and the film just came out in February. Yeah, congratulations on that. We'll get into indigenous people a little bit later. But Celine, your family is synonymous with oceans. Are you more passionate? And what were you doing? You were in the forest, which may be an unusual place to, for a Cousteau, maybe not. Um, but are you more passionate about sea life or people? Um, I'm passionate about the human story at the center of the environmental story, no matter what ecosystem. Um, I, I'm just as comfortable being thrown in the ocean as I am hiking in the jungle. Um, I, I like to think I have a fin on one foot and a hiking boot on the other ready to go. 
Um, I think the important part is really making the human nature connection, no matter where it happens. Yeah, and we'll get into that. Davis Guggenheim, your dad won four Academy Awards for making documentary films, including one for remembrance of Robert F. Kennedy shortly after his assassination was shown at the Democratic National Convention. You followed, you followed in your dad's footsteps. And in the 1980s, when you were in college, you wanted to make a documentary about apartheid. What advice did your dad give you then? Well, I told him I was very excited. I was because I, I, I admired my dad. He was a wonderful man and a great filmmaker. And I said, I'm going to make this film about apartheid. <clears throat> and he said, well, who's it about? I go, well, it's not about people. It's about this big thing. And it's this movement. And he's like, well, if you don't have a person you're following, that's really hard as a storyteller. And I've, I've kept that with me. He always said that people, when they're watching a movie, care about people. And, uh, and uh, I've, whenever I've uh, done that, it's worked out pretty well. Whenever I've forgotten that, my films get a little too far off and a little bit hard to identify with. I think um, I'm always trying to find stories that are universal, that can bring more people together. And if you can humanize almost anybody, there's a few people who you can't humanize, but uh, that, that really, I think, is a, a, great, a great thing. And, that's, and I, keep, I keep my father on my shoulder every day at work. In connection with humans and nature is a theme in all of your work. And see a lot of documentary films about climate change, I think they lose that human element. They're about issues and systems. And mm -hmm. Christina Biedermeyer, you say that we want to imagine wild animals accepting us into their world, a world where humans evolved for thousands of years. How do you think about that when you're pho photographing wild animals in their, in their habitat? It's an interesting thing. I enjoy so much uh, your comments, David and, and Celine, because it is true. It's about the human experience as a citizen of this planet. And most people are, for whatever reason, not in a position to experience that in the way that so many of us have, with a fin on, on one foot and a high point on the other. And a lot of people are afraid, frankly, you know, and I think we have raised an entire generation that is afraid of getting dirty or getting sick or whatever, and they don't go to nature. So when you can create images that allow people to imagine themselves interacting with nature, especially with animals, I think people just crave that, you know, the friendship with an octopus. Can you imagine? Yeah, well, that, that's quite, quite a film. Uh, Celine Cousteau, you talk about swimming near a humpback whale and it looking you in the eye and acknowledging mm. you. What is it like to come eye to eye with a whale? <laughs> um, you feel really small. And I don't mean just in size, I mean in importance, um, because we are, we're tiny. I mean, human beings are tiny on this planet. We're just really numerous and, and impactful, which can be negative or positive. Um, but that moment that, that a humpback whale looked at me, I just kind of stopped in the water and just felt my existence. Um, it's hard to describe. And, and, you know, touching on what Christina says, a lot of people either are afraid to or don't have the opportunity to get in nature, but there's so many, um, there's so many moments in nature that really touch on the heart of what we are in this, in this bigger system, that we are just one species amongst others. And that moment eye to eye with a humpback whale, for me, was just a, a, a stark example of it and a privileged one. Christina Miedermeyer, you have a million and a half followers on Instagram, which is pretty darn big. And yet you also say you, that makes you feel small. But are, are we supposed to feel small in nature or is feeling small in the face of climate change? Um, uh, I think we're an arrogant species. You know, I think I, I think it humbles us and makes us really uncomfortable when we feel small and insignificant. For me, the act of stepping into nature is always um, a tacit contract where you become part of a food chain and you become part of, of a system that you don't control. I like that feeling. Uh, but uh, I think humans, especially, you know, the culture that we have created for ourselves over the last 100 to 150 years is one of supremacy over nature. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think many of us, that's what we're trying to change with our films and our narratives, you know, try to create a more equitable relationship with nature. I went to, I lived in China in the early 80s, uh, or late 80s after college. And I remember, the, so the classical Chinese paintings will always show these huge mountains and show the humans as, you know, very tiny relative to nature, which was, I thought was like 
odd to me. That's not, I hadn't seen that before going to, to live in China. Davis Guggenheim, the poster for an inconvenient truth features a hurricane coming out of a smokestack. You know, what are the dominant images you think of that define the climate narrative? Well, it's interesting when uh, that poster was presented to me by Paramount Studios, I thought this is, this is sensationalistic. It's um, over the top. The, 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 in the trailer, it says the scariest movie you'll ever see. And I was really upset about it. I mean, I, I went to the mat saying this is a terrible way to market this film. It turned out to be a really good way to market this film. So, so I learned a lot. Um, um, I, when I made the film, I wanted, it, I wanted the tone of it to be um, moderate and not political and to reach as far to the middle and even to the right as I could. Um, so I, that, the, the, the answer for me is, well, the, the lesson for me is that marketing a film is very different than making a film and what your story is. But the, the, there's a lot of, I have a lot of answers to that question, but I think for that movie, the images that seemed to resonate with people were the polar bear swimming in the water and you know putting its paw up on a piece of ice that was too small to find <laughs> um, firm ground and swimming away back into the endless ocean people you could hear people gasp in every screening of that movie and then Al Gore was really smart about at that point reinforcing in almost every slide the um, CO2 marching up and it, how it would go up, how you visualized it, it's sort of imprinted. But that's, a, that's more than 10 years ago. And, and in a sense, the, the, the challenge is very different. Back then it was like, is it real? And do we understand it? I think now the challenge is that further in this conversation, but now it's about, now that a lot of people believe it's real and that we're causing it, now what do we do? And how do we activate people? So I think the images um, might have to change. Um, yeah, more solutions oriented, which I think you acknowledge that there weren't, a, there wasn't a lot of solutions in Inconvenient Truth, which was actually 15 years ago, if I got it right, this year. So, yeah, I think I think the um, the good, the bad news is is that the problem the, the problem is worse than we imagined, and the good news is now there are more solutions. Christina Mittermeier, polar bears are probably the most iconic image associated with climate change. Your partner. Photographer Paul Nicklin made a video of a sto starving polar bear in the Canadian Arctic in 2017 around Baffin Island. I think I was there around that time. Uh, you were there as well. The National Geographic video went viral and reportedly was seen more than two billion times. Your photograph, I think, was the top 10 for the year. Looking back now, what do you see as the lasting impact of that weak, hungry, sad polar bear limping around in the final hours of its life? Yeah, I think um, Davis and Salim would agree with me that it's 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 never the one moment. You know, I remember mm -hmm. Davis when the Inconvenient Truth came out, the book. It was a sense of relief, and you know, I felt almost like a polar bear. You know, because for those of us who have made a living trying to convey with science, with images, you know, what's happening and the gravity of the situation, and you know, the, the denial arguments were so exhausting that when Convenient Truth came out, it was really a moment that it all turned out. And yet it didn't last, right? I mean, people move on. And so we are continuously striving, Greg, to make those iconic moments. And as artists, all we can do is hope that you can make people stop for one moment and think. And the starving polar bear was that, you know, we had no idea that it was going to cause such a stir, but yes, it went, it went viral and so many things were revealed just how emotionally invested people are in the welfare of animals, how upset they get when action is not taken. But we also got a really deep look at the uh, enormous amount of people that are still in denial, at the machinery of communications behind the continual denial of the problem and how well-funded they are. You know, we started getting a glimpse at all these think tanks that are out there putting out the uh, wrong information. And the one thing I kept thinking, Greg, was they're investing so much money in 
perpetuating this situation and the lie, how much money are we investing? Because as a filmmaker, as a photographer, it's always so hard to get the funding to go out there to tell more stories. So are we investing at the same scale at the solution? And this is a question for all the donors out there. Uh, but yeah, the starving polar bear, for me, it's just a page in the book. I hope to make many more images that continue to stir our emotions into action. Davis Guggenheim, you've heard about test screenings of movies in which many humans die in a gunfight and audience are concerned about a little puppy somewhere in the scene. What does that say to you about, you know, human concern for, for animals? Yeah, uh, yeah, we were talking about this the other day about how um, in my former life, I was a television director and you get these test results back and you know, in, in the show where, you know, there's gunfights and people are dying and stuff, the audience doesn't care about those people, even characters that you know, but they care about the puppy that the, the villain kicks on the way out of the bar, right? And um, I'd have to be, have a degree to understand why that's the case. But I think do people do project a lot of their empathy and a lot of their emotions onto animals. Uh, and that's just something to understand uh, um, it, and I think also um, it's hard to um, connect to large groups of people. I think that's the other thing I've, I've learned is that if you say, well, 100,000 people, but if you, if you, and Celine and Christina know this, uh, it's, it's pretty simple, but if you, if you meet one person and you understand them and you can find commonality, uh, that, that, that then you can, then an audience can reach beyond even, uh, you know, someone who, is, who lives very far away from you and very differently from you. Well, Celine Cousteau, you've done that in the Amazon with your, your recent film, An Indigenous People Occupy Rainforests and Other Lands That May Be Key to Stabilizing the Climate. And deforestation and oil extraction and gold mining are threatening their way of life in the Javari Valley in Brazil and elsewhere. You know, connect with us for the resource extraction in the Amazon. And how did you try to sort of humanize and make familiar these people that are seem to be exotic and you know, primitive, I realize that's a colonial term, but you know, they're frozen in time. How did you try to humanize and make them relatable for, a, you know, affluent people in rich Northern countries? Um, several ways. One is I actually listened to my mentors around me. Um, and despite the fact that I did not want to be in the story, I was not planning on being in front of the camera. I did place myself in front of the camera so that I would create a bridge um, so that the audience would follow me as somebody perhaps more familiar, mm -hmm. more accessible, um, mm -hmm. the neighbor, and follow me into this adventure and, and through me meet the people that affected my life. Um, I also chose to um, be more vulnerable than perhaps I would have wanted because the story wasn't about me. But I chose to actually film inside my home. I'm fiercely protective of my personal space. Um, but I thought it was important if I asked the audience to stretch their ability to create a connection with people they don't know that I had to let them in a little bit more than I otherwise would have. Um, so that's one way. Another one is that I didn't craft any of these scenes. Um, I didn't ask any of the indigenous people, no matter which village or which uh, tribe we were visiting, I didn't ask them to put together a ceremony or a ritual or ask them to go hunt. We really just followed the ebb and flow of their life. Um, and sometimes that means we may have missed out on the absolute beauty shot that would have made, you know, the scene in the film. Um, but I think it showed something much more intimate because it was authentic. And, and I think that at the end of the day, that shows in the film. Um, it's not the blockbuster, uh, big splash film. It's, it's truth. It's intimacy. Um, and some of it's ugly and, and some of it's beautiful. Yeah, a lot of it is, is beautiful. And you do see your son bounding down the stairs in your home before you set off. Um, but connect for us the resource. There's the sort of the why should I care question. We hear a lot mm -hmm. about the Amazon as this faraway place uh, for someone listening to this in Canada, Europe, North America. Um, why should, what, what, how are, are we connected, the, our lives, to the people you portray in Brazil in the, in the Amazon? A lot of ways. Um, one very simple one, if you enjoy breathing, you're connected to the Amazon and its people. Um, about 20% of our oxygen comes from the Amazon rainforest. And where there are indigenous people, where there is protected indigenous land, there's no deforestation. There's actually less deforestation on indigenous land than there is on conservation land. 
So the presence of people in this case creates an additional barrier to protect the territory. Um, the Javari territory in particular is uh, deemed irreplaceable in terms of biodiversity by the IUCN, the International Union of Conservation for Nature. Um, and one of the projects we're hoping to do is discover that biodiversity. Um, and that biodiversity is something we all count on. I, um, if you think about your pharmaceuticals, uh, most of our pharmaceuticals have their roots in nature. If there's undiscovered biodiversity, that's the potential for our future medicine. Um, and there's no better example than what the world is going through today when we think of something that could impact all of us. Um, and then there's just all the products we use. Very simply put, I mean, if, it, you know, if we have gold in any of our jewelry, if we have hardwood in any of our furniture, um, a lot of those things come from places like that. And we may not know that they are harvested illegally, um, but it's important to understand that there are a lot of these products that, that come from uh, extraction that is unsustainable or impacting Indigenous lives. Christina Mittermeier, you also work and photograph a number of Indigenous people, some really uh, beautiful photographs. Who is Will George and how do you give him his power back by taking his photograph? Um, Will George is uh, a member of the Slail Watuth First Nation in British Columbia, a community that has been impacted uh, by the construction of uh, oil pipelines through their territory. And they have been fighting the construction of another pipeline coming in from the interior from Alberta uh, to carry crude to the coast of British Columbia, which then gets carried to China and then gets to, you know, for refining and then gets brought back into Canada. And Will George and his uh, tribe members have been standing up to the construction of this pipeline, have been disrupting, have been protesting, and they invited me to uh, come and spend a day with them and photograph them. And I, they built a beautiful, what they call the watch house, where people could come in and have ceremony and spend time together. And like Celine, I don't like photographing indigenous people as if they were encapsulated in the past in a romanticized way that no longer exists. You know, they live and walk amongst us and they look like us. And so does Will, you know, Will works in the Home Depot, but uh, he brought in his uh, family's headdress and he put it, put it on. And I asked him, I said, how angry are you at, you know, the infractions that this government imposes on indigenous people, not just his tribe, but so many of them. And he, you know, expressed his anger. And when I showed him the photograph, and I don't know if this has happened to you, Celine, but for communities like the Tsleil-Waututh and so many others in British Columbia, they were forbidden for generations to wear their traditional costume, to mm. speak their language. They were, you know, you know, in, they were taken to uh, re residential schools where they were taught not to speak their language. Anyway, when you, when you show them a photograph of themselves wearing their family's ancestral regalia, you return something to them. And part of it is the power and part of it is the pride and part of it is the understanding of the place they have in this fight and to protect our planet. One photo of yours, uh, Christina, that I really like is a young indigenous person sitting on rocks near the ocean with a fishing net in their hand, mm. face paint, headdress, and Chuck Taylor sneakers. Uh, <laughs> which just shows that like, this is a, you know, a real modern teenage, probably a teenager. Um, so tell us about that photo and what it's, yeah. That is the Northern tip of Vancouver Island, a community called Alert Bay and the Namgis people live there. And um, I, I was invited and I was so honored uh, because the potlatch is uh, something that has returned now that uh, indigenous Canadians have more opportunity to express uh, their culture. So I was invited to a potlatch and I was surprised by so many young people who are now learning the language and the songs and the dances. And I noticed this girl because she was part of that potlatch, her passionate dance, but I was not allowed to photograph in the big house. So I, I, looked, I looked her up on Facebook and I talked to her and I said, you know, I would love to photograph you. And so we, we set up a date on the beach and this is how she showed up. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, Davis Guggenheim, you had never met a Muslim family before you made a film about one of the most famous Muslims in the world, Malala. How did you approach that uh, going into that, that culture? What kind of humility did you have to summon? And yeah, how did you go about getting so close to, yeah, one of the most famous teenagers in the world? It was interesting. I, um, it's a great question. 
she was 15 and a half and was still recovering from, from, um, I mean, she woke up in a UK hospital, not knowing what the UK was. Um, and, um, with, I, I approached it the same way I approach everything, which is, uh, an, an attempt at humility, um, an openness, um, a vulnerability. I think vulnerability is a really important thing. It's like, are you, and, 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 um, uh, but this family, um, it's, you know, it's Malala, her mother, Torpakai, her, her father, Ziuddin, her brother's Kushal and at Hall. And, um, but I, I maybe was introduced to a few Muslims in my life, but never welcomed into a home. And uh, uh, it was awkward at first. It was generally awkward, but uh, within a few days, we all fell in love with each other. They, they, they would often touch my hair to see if it was real. They thought it was, I was the oddest person in the world and they laughed at me and uh, that was a good sign. But I'm sure that Christina and Celine feel the same way where you, you know, um, it's always different with everybody. But the most important thing is you, 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 you earn trust slowly and over time and with humility and, 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 and being vulnerable. One of the most, just, uh, sorry, sure, Celine. I just want to jump in for a second. I, I love um, just the, the overlays of what Davis and Christina are saying is, you know, we, we're just three human beings being human in the world. And yet the stories that we're telling all have things in common. This one, the, the awkwardness, Davis, that you're describing and being laughed at is a good sign. Well, I felt awkwardness and laughed at in the, in the indigenous villages in the Brazilian Amazon. And I was like, oh, this is good. Okay, this is good. Human, human interaction. Um, and Christina, I've been to Alert Bay. And as soon as you, you said Alert Bay, like all of my memories came back. And you realize that our stories cross um, cross each other, not at the same time, but same places or same feelings or same emotions. And in those interconnections, we realize, oh, there's a, th there's that common thread, right? We can weave these common threads through our stories here, but through all the stories that we tell and all the people we meet. And I think that's the beauty of storytelling is it, is it creates those connections. And if you really listen to what people are saying, you're like, oh, wait, this, this happened to me, or I felt this as well, or I was there too, or I met that person. Um, I think that's the beauty of, of what we do. And can I add just a little thought, Greg? I promise to be short. The other interesting thing for those of us who work with uh, people that are not from the Western world is that we're all on social media. You know, I've made friends with almost everybody that I have photographed, even in remote indigenous communities in the Amazon, and stayed in, you know, in touch with them through WhatsApp or Facebook. <laughs> and so it gives you the opportunity when you get a, an email or a text from somebody like Will George saying, they're taking me to jail. I would love to use that photograph you know, to rally for my defense. It gives you just such an honor to be able to continue to help. We're recording this show with a live audience and one question from uh, listener Lisa. Are there other films in the pipeline like My Octopus Teacher, which was about love and connection and a deep knowing of place? And this is, I think a lot of people saw this uh, film. I know that when my wife and I watched it, she would, people were just gushing about it. It was, it was amazing. Um, so Christina, tell us about the film a little bit and, and how you reacted to seeing it. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, Craig Foster, the filmmaker, is a dear friend and his wife, Swati, and I have been fellow warriors in many conservation battles. And so I knew that they were making this film. And the part that they struggled, and this is where I would love to get Davis's and Celine's thoughts, was how do you provide a call to action to people that are watching your film that's tangible and in the moment? And the octopus teacher was, yes, of course, about the relationship of this man with the, his backyard, this beautiful kelp forest and, and the octopus, but there, the deeper intention that they had was, you, you know, how do we use this to rally for protection? There is a devastating octopus fishery, uh, all these ropes have entangled so many whales and it's slowly cause, causing the demise. And that's where I want us to go as a, an artistic filmmaking community to being able to use the social media and the technology platforms, platforms that we have to build the larger community and the call to action that people can continue taking. 
And Celine Cousteau, it seems like the one thing that that, you know, there's a one to one relationship in that film that's very deep and beautiful. And that's very different than a lot of uh, nature documentaries, et cetera, where you see, you know, a charismatic megafauna briefly and then it and then it moves on. But there's like, I mean, there I mean, there is intimacy between this exotic creature and this and this man. So tell us, your, yeah, your thoughts about my octopus teacher and wh what it illustrates. Well, so I think powerful. what worked really well there was um, was that it was a relationship. And it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it was interspecies; species, it was a relationship and, and you inherently understood that and you understood the love that was created, the admiration, um, <clears throat> the peace that, that was brought to him by, by having this contact with nature, the reverence he had for the animal, the understanding the animal allowed him to be in its, in its realm and its world. Um, the people that I that I have heard from who aren't in our in, in our circles, I'll say, of either filmmaking or nature or environmental protection, were in awe of it, and they all felt it. So to to kind of answer the question, Christina, as well of like, how do we get people to motivate to action? I think part of what we do in storytelling is intangible, and that's mm -hmm. I know for me really difficult because we share a story with the world, we don't really know what they're going to do with it, and we don't necessarily at the end of a film, just want to say, here's your to-do list. Um, because part of it is, is about shifting consciousness. And I think that that's something that's, it's, I know it's hard for me, um, but I have a filmmaker friend who years ago said this to me. He says, do not ever forget that one of your main um, focus and goals is to shift consciousness. And you may never know exactly what your films or stories have done, but you need to believe in, in what you're doing. Um, so there's no easy answer of, you know, putting a little PSA at the end of your film kind of breaks the magic of that love between this human and this animal. Um, I think people will follow up and they, and they do in, in their own ways. I know some people who are not eating octopus anymore because of the film. And if that's Yay. all that was done, I'm, I'm applauding it. David Skugenheim, uh, you know, there's the Documentary films now are platforms for action. Participant media and other groups are trying to, you know, use them to mobilize people and inconvenient truth, uh, and, you know, awaken a generation. Your thoughts on My Octopus Teacher? In fact, you noted earlier when we talked that the man seemed to have a closer relationship with the octopus than his own son. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, they seem like a lovely family. And that was more of a question, not knowing anything. Um, but I like, I like, what Celine was saying, I think the filmmaker's job first is to tell a story. Uh, and I always like to think of the movies I make as, okay, what is the story outside of the issue that you're making? We always thought In Community Truth was a redemption story about a politician who lost an election and it was his mission in life to, to tell this truth that he knew. Uh, and of course, the movie had tons of charts and graphs and all that sort of stuff. But at the core, heart of it, you identified with him. I think what's great about a octopus teacher, it's a love story. And like every great love story, the love stories are always the formula for love stories are the simplest of formulas, which is, you know, these two, these two, I would usually say people, but like these two <laughs> um, organisms, you know, and they want to be together desperately and it could be Dr. Shivago and it could be um, a teen flick but a great love story are the obstacles that, that get in their way they, they come closer and then the obstacles pull them apart they get closer and the obstacles that pull them apart and you know what's beautiful about that movie is it just works as a love story first and um, I think that's our job first is to is to tell that story that casts a spell on you and uh, sometimes, not always, I think sometimes the message, and it happens in my movies a lot, the message breaks that spell. And so you have to figure out a way to also, um, to, 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 and I don't want to go on too long, but we had a great um, lesson we learned when we made Incommunity Truth where we had no prescription and we showed people the film and they're like, well, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> and so we learned at the end to put uh, things you can do in the end credits. And that was a great breakthrough for us. So you're constantly trying, because I a lot of my films are about issues, but how do you tell that story and keep the spell from breaking and then give people what they want uh, once, once, you've, once you've cast the spell and they're asking for it?
Can I, can I ask a question, Greg, to, to Davis? Because you're absolutely right. And I've been to documentaries where you're so involved with this issue, you know, by the time you finish watching the movie, you really feel an investment. And if no outlet is given to you to, to feel better, you, know, you just leave so depressed. Yeah, I know. And, I, and I, it's interesting. I watch my kids. I'm, I love David Attenborough's work. I love it. And it's, um, it's done, an inc- I mean, his life of service to tell stories is beyond anybody's. Um, and yet I watch, I was watching with my 14 year old and there are these, there's this moment where you see these beautiful monkeys. I'll, I'll be really quick. You see these beautiful monkeys, you fall in love with them. And then he says, well, their forest is disappearing. And then you're sort of left with that. I know that feeling. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a riddle that, that's, not, that's not always solved the same way. Mm-hmm. So Christina, that gets to, you know, beauty, you know, there's someone uh, told me that the terms, you know, apocalyptic subline that there's, you know, there's the imagery that's used in climate is all of this disappearing beauty. A lot of it is very depressing. A lot of the climate story is very depressing. Here's melting glaciers, melting this, you know, dying trees, death everywhere. How do you wrestle with the emotional balance of, you know, you want to find inspirational beauty, but there's also loss and sadness in that I mean, in that beauty. You know, because storytelling is so ingrained into who we are as humans, uh, we're not the first ones to come up with <laughs> with how to tell those stories. And for me, you know, the great storytellers like uh, Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, you know, he didn't start his speech by telling us, I have a nightmare. He, <laughs> he, he told us about his dream and this vision that he had for a better, you know, more equ- equitable society. And then he reminded us on the same speech of the perils and the pits and all the hard work ahead to make it better. And then he reminded us again, you know, if we do the work, this is where we'll go. And I think a, a, a good narration takes you through those emotional valleys and hills uh, because it's just human. Um, That's part of it. We're talking about the visual dimensions of climate storytelling with Celine Cousteau, filmmaker of her new film is about indigenous communities in the Amazon as tribes on the edge. Christina Mittermeier, am I saying that right, Mittermeier? Mittermeier, it's my my ex-husband's name. So yeah, you can say it however you want. Christina, Christina Mittemeyer is a photographer, conservationist, and marine biologist, and Davis Guggenheim, a filmmaker who directed and produced An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, Christina, you say that whenever you have felt scared or lonely, women have given you shelter and comfort. You also say that women over, all over the world want one thing, control over their reproductive future. So how do you visually tell those stories of comfort, nurturing, and desire for sovereignty over their bodies? So funny. I mean, I'm sure Celine and and you too, Davis, you know, when you travel to these remote communities and you are the awkward outsider and you are so ill-equipped and you are just so uncomfortable, um, people will come to your aid. But as a woman, so often it is women who you know, in such subtle and wonderful ways invite you to a place where you feel a little better about, you know, being an outsider. And that comes in many, many ways. I honestly believe that there's this invisible sisterhood around the planet. And I've always relied on women to alert me when there's danger or to give me shelter when I've had my children. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, And it's difficult to quantify, right? It's just anecdotal. (laughs) But I think women help women. And the part about uh, the reproductive future, it's just because I've seen it since I was a little girl. That's all that women want, you know, and I grew up in a Catholic country where it's so difficult to speak about, uh, you know, contraception or abortion or, or all those issues. And when you talk to women, they just want to have some control over how many children, when to have them, how to support them. And it's, it's a very difficult conversation always. I mean, Davis, I'm sure you know so much more than I do about the, the you know, the enormous issues that women face in Muslim countries. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, poignant moments in uh, He Named Me Malala was, she says, if I was an ordinary Pac- girl in Pakistan, I would have two children by now. She was 15. Another was when her father looked at the family tree and there were no women on the family tree. 
And we know now, Davis, that empowering women, educating girls are among the top ways to cut carbon emissions. You know, as the person who made the movie about climate change and the one about Amala, I wonder if about Malala, if climate change ever came up when you were t talking with her. It didn't, but I think it could have. And I think uh, they do connect a hundred percent. And uh, um, so, yeah, I, 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 I believe everything you just said is true, Christina. And um, uh, you know, I, I, because I think all these things connect. Yeah. And pa patriarchy, right? You worry about, you say patriarchy is embedded in capitalism, Davis. Well, I, we were talking the other day that, that, um, that when you, when you see the, 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 um, this is getting political, but when you see, uh, um, how, how can you not be political? Um, when you see the barriers to making real change in, in climate, uh, capitalism is a big obstacle. If you want to see, uh, ask steel companies to make green steel, concrete makers making green concrete, uh, car makers are finally changing, but capitalism and people with, uh, protecting their money and wanting to make more are a big obstacle in the way of that. So it is the type of capitalism that we practice, right? Which is this patriarchal capitalism that leaves planet and people behind. Celine Cousteau, is there commercial pressure to present indigenous people in a certain way with body paint and piercings to satisfy the expectations of audiences in rich countries? There's, there's a form of capitalism, you know, reach, you know, mm. someone invests in a documentary film, they want to, you know, reach a big market to sell ads? Is there commercial pressures that, and how do you navigate that trying to maximize the audience you reach with your work? Um, the way I maximized um, the, the telling of the story is that I was not dependent on any outside um, IOUs. Um, it's a completely independent film, um, nonprofit, all of the um, money put in was, um, were donations. So I didn't have anybody telling me how to tell the film. <laughs> and um, that was really important to me, but it's also why it took so long is because it was the long road. Um, but I felt that I had to deserve the honor to tell the story. And, and part of the trial and error was testing my conviction that I could, that I could do it in a way that honored the voices of the people I work for, the indigenous people in the film. Um, however, when I first went into the indigenous territory uh, in 2007, not doing my film, Tribes on the Edge, but the previous film, um, we were going to see the Matisse tribe, one of the then five contacted tribes. There are now six contacted tribes. And um, we were going there not because they're more interesting than the others, but only because my grandfather had been there 25 years earlier. And that's, that was our motivation for going. <laughs> And um, when we said, you know, can we bring our team in, granted small, small team for PBS, public broadcast station, and we, um, we got a long list back from the Matisse of the demands. Um, and it started with a satellite dish, a 10 inch television, uh, I believe it was three outboard motors, a diesel generator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then 5,000 US dollars at the bottom. And I'm looking at this long list and I, I said, well, I'm not telling you you can't or can't have these things. That's not my place. But we can't provide them because we actually don't, we just don't have that budget. The beautiful thing that happened within that is that we ended up at this indigenous conference, which then inspired my film. The reason the Matisse were asking for all of this is that the Matisse tribe um, are, they have tattoos on, on the side of their face like jaguar claws. Um, they have multiple piercings in their nose and they use uh, spines from a palm tree to um, emulate the whiskers of the jaguar. Um, they sometimes wear a big boar husk through the middle of their nose. Um, they have huge ear piercings, the men do at least. And they have been very photographed by the likes of Discovery, Nat Geo, BBC, who have all gone in and filmed. Well, the other tribes, their neighbors, are just as interesting culturally. They're just as amazing. They have a, a, an amazing history. They have rituals. They have ceremony. But they're not as typified they're less decorated. And so they end up less on camera. They end up less uh, interesting to, I'm gonna say the white person as we are all called as outsiders, um, than, than do the Matisse. And so there's an exploitation on behalf of fellow storytellers to go into places that might seem more exotic or beautiful or colorful. Um, and so I endeavored to not do the same thing. 
Um, the Matisse are represented in the film. But I chose to go to the Kulina tribe um, because the Kulina aren't represented in any of the stories because they were almost completely wiped out and they're considered one of the weaker, weaker, I say, tribes by the other tribes. And I said, well, I want to go see them. Why aren't we telling their stories? Um, it, it backlashed <laughs> in the sense that one of the other tribes got very angry because they were the stronger, more aggressive tribe and I didn't come to them first. So when we went to their village, which we had been invited to, they met us with machetes. Um, yes. And they said, no, you can't come in. I said, but you're, we just spoke to your chief two days ago. And he said, they said, no, you have to leave. I realize in all of this, we know so little. We know so little. When we come in as outsiders, our lens, our camera lenses, but our lens is this small because we are only seeing a slice of a very long story. And so you enter with respect and, and awareness of what's going on around you and you, you tread lightly and you never put, for me, I don't push boundaries because I wouldn't appreciate it if somebody came into my home and pushed boundaries. Mm. We're talking about climate storytelling with Celine Cousteau, Christina Mittermeier, and Davis Guggenheim. I'm Greg Dalton. The, our human ability to deeply absorb images of nature depends on how our brain receives them. Dr. Laura Sewell has taught us eco-psychology and environmental perception at Prescott and Bates Colleges. We asked her to help us understand how visual media connects us with the natural world. When we're sort of gazing into the natural world or in it, we're not cognitively trying to do very much. Whereas when we look at facts or graphs or lists of data or reading books about climate science, it takes a lot of cognitive effort. And we, for the most part, don't like to work too hard cognitively. It takes a lot of metabolic energy. We almost always want to choose cognitive ease. So if there's imagery that is easy to access and it's got these wonderful natural associations, we're going to absorb it more readily. Let's take advertising using nature to seduce us into buying a Jeep that will then tear up the terrain. There's no mistake there. There's an understanding that the associations are activated and we're feeling all sorts of pleasurable stuff and we want that Jeep too. But there's a lot of good work out there. Some of those Patagonia and North Face short story adventure films, they've got great footage. They show the reasons to be engaged, the wonder of the world. And in the background is the message of this being in peril, this adventuresomeness, this possibility. So here's great human potential, great experience. And just remember, it might be lost, but you've got all sorts of ability. That was Dr. Laura Sewell, author of Sight and Sensibility, the Eco-Psychology of Perception. Davis Guggenheim, you're interested in how the human brain perceives climate threats. How conscious are you of how nature's being used in the video and photographic advertisements that you see on screen? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just at the beginning of research on a, another movie about what I, what I uh, simplistically call the psychology of climate change. So I'm not really thinking so much about imagery. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how this heavy, heavy sense of catastrophe plays on all of us as we live our lives, especially on my own children um, and everyone's children. Uh, I think that's another angle into this problem. Well, um, tell, tell us about your, your son's 21st birthday. You bought him a, his first case of beer and it ended up in a, a surprising conversation about climate change. Yeah, so this is a couple of years ago. He was in college, it was his uh, junior year. And uh, my wife and I said, can we visit you on your 21st birthday? And he said, sure. And in, in America, when you turn 21, you can, you're, you can legally drink. And so it was, it was a big, really fun night with all his roommates, like eight of his friends. 
all, little mismatched tables pushed together and beer and take out Chinese food. And it was just the most fun I've had in a long time. Still, I, it's one of my best memories ever. But about two o'clock in the morning, I asked one of his best friends. I said, well, how many children do you think you'll have? This, uh, he, uh, this is uh, my, my son's friend. And he said, uh, oh, I, I wouldn't bring children into this world. And then we went down the line and none of my son's friends uh, said they would bring children into this world, including my son. And the striking thing was that, um, but it was also the fact that very few of them talk about climate change. And so they feel this great sense of catastrophe and yet they don't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I want, I, I, I'm interested in how they carry that. And perhaps uh, if there's a way to sort of unlock that and understand that, then maybe that's another angle into uh, breaking through in this really, in this really- Same age and none of them wanna have children either, which is no surprise, but they live very close to the issue through us, right? Through our passion. I noticed that young people feel in general so overwhelmed and disempowered and, you know, to deal with this is a lot. So I wanted to find a way of connect, giving them an opportunity to be connected that was not a heavy lift emotionally or otherwise. So we built a platform where you can tell short stories. So it's very, you know, contained, but they're emotional and they're beautiful. And at the end of every story, there's a call, there's something that you can do right then and there, you know, it can be a sign a petition or tweet to a prime minister or donate $5 to a community. That sense of I've done my part is really important. And through stories, you can tell people, you know, this is what you contributed to. When they hear that it, they're part of a bigger community making a difference, I think it starts lifting that sense of foreboding doom. <laughs> yeah, it's very deep. It's one of the things that's mobilized climate action lately is young people um, putting pressure. And, and there, yeah, there's a certain... Um, resignation um, and you know the, the weight I have kids who are you know early 20s late teens and really worry about the burden and often don't honestly talk to them a lot about it because I don't want dad's job to be you know to be you know a, a burden on them um, we have a question from what person watching on the live stream we're recording this show with a live audience and one question from a listener Lori asks can we make a movie about the Amazon being burned for grazing lands and growing palm oil and focus on the companies behind that so they can be boycotted and shamed into stopping what they are doing Celine Cousteau is that is that your next film Oh, my next film. I, I have to uh, first openly admit that I have a little bit of uh, storytelling exhaustion, <laughs> um, which is hard to admit on a on a on a discussion about storytelling. <laughs> It'll go away, Celine. You'll be It'll fine. <laughs> I feel like I just got through this one and and um, the next one. Yeah, there will of course there will be a next one. I mean, this is this is who we are. It's not what we do. It's just who we are. Um, you know what I think is unfortunate about the whole, uh, it, just talking about the, the fires in the Amazon is that when the fires happened a couple of years ago, um, or at least when the press around the fires happened a couple of years ago, um, people said, oh, you know, what's happening with the fires? We need to stop this. I'm like, do you realize the fires happen every year? Every year, every year. It's just when there is a lull in the news or when the fires are bigger or when there's a scandal around it because there's a certain president who blatantly doesn't really care. Um, the thing about telling a story about the fires in the Amazon is that the, I'm going to say the powers that be, I'm not going to get political, but political and corporate powers that be don't want that to stop because when the land is cleared, you can then sow crop or put cattle. And so if a land is cleared legally or illegally, the trees are done. Um, and the next thing that's going to happen is, is cattle grazing and, um, and agriculture. So it's nothing new. Um, this is where the, the storytelling exhaustion kicks in because I feel like not just my family, but so many people have repeating have been repeating stories over and over and over again. Um, Single-use plastics is a perfect example. 
I've, we've been saying this ad nausea, single use plastics, look at the oceans. I mean, I see Christina smiling. I'm just like, and all of a sudden in the past two, three years, it's become popular and phenomenal that it has, but it really takes such a long time for the, for the positive kickback to come in um, that we have to do more. And at the same time, going back to the previous question, I, it, it can't create eco-anxiety. Um, the young generation really feels it. My son's younger. He's nine. Um, he acutely knows what's going on because he sees me working every day. And when somebody says, what does your mom do? He says, oh, Celine, you know, my mom is, she's saving the jungle and the indigenous people. Well, I'm, I'm not doing that by myself. <laughs> um, I think, first of all, we all need to take responsibility um, because the story's ours. And, and going back to the, the beginning of this conversation, you asked me about Beto Marubo. Um, when somebody in the audience asked Beto of the Marubo tribe, what can they do to help? They saw the film, what can we do? Beto says, now that you, you've seen my story, keep telling the story because it becomes yours. And I think that that's something that we can ask our audiences to do own the story like it's yours because then you will do something about it. So whether it's Amazon fires, plastics in the ocean, the polar bear, um, human rights, uh, sex trafficking, own the story like it's yours and then do something about it. Find your passion and follow through. Another question from our live audience watching this program uh, from George says, shouldn't we dramatically reduce world population so other species can re be returned and expanding populations needn't war for land and resources? Uh, Christina, you talked about uh, reproductive rights. A lot of environmentalists don't like to talk about population because it's charged it's, it's a yeah. taboo topic nobody yeah. nobody wants to be told how many children to have but i do know one thing when we educate girls when girls like malala have an opportunity to get an education and to follow their passions and to make decisions about their own future population is reduced i firmly believe that we need a more feminine leadership we need to get rid of these colonial colonial patriarchal you know capitalistic mindset that's taking us to this place and i feel that you know the solution may already be here and the person who may solve it may already be born in africa or asia and she may not have access to school so the one thing we all can do is lift the girls around you make sure that they don't feel like you know certain things are not for girls or you know and as we lift the girls let's make let's make sure that we're raising boys that are not going to fall into that patriarchal aggressive violent uh, mindset hey christina can you just put Please put your boom down a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Um, uh, the other way, down towards your toes. Yeah. Um, we have another question from our audience member watching the live stream. Sarah says, do you feel there's a way that environmental filmmaking can go beyond the visual, showing conditions, people, beauty, and solutions? Uh, Davis Guggenheim, one of the critiques of Inconvenient Truth was it was short on solutions. Do you think now we can have a compelling story that is positive and shows solutions? Of course, and I think uh, there are so many <laughs> incredible stories that have been told by the people, you know, by Christina and Celine. And uh, if you look at climate change as bigger than a world war, which I think it is, it's a it's a inaccurate comparison. But let's say World War II, there have been hundreds of stories about World War II. You know, some are very technical, some are very historic, some have been about a, a, a few soldiers, some have been about people who were, um, who were victims. Uh, some are cultural, some are romantic, some are um, uh, vilifying enemies, some are lifting up heroes. There, there, there are, and to, to take that back to climate change, I think there are thousands and thousands of stories that we will have to continue to, to tell. And uh, the difference, I, of course, Davis, is that, you know, we know how World War II ended. And I, you know, I've, I've heard Ira Glass, for example, say climate stories are depressing because we know how they're going to end. We're all screwed. And if, you know, it's like the, the, the ending is not a surprise and it also hasn't happened yet. So doesn't that create a challenge for storytelling of something as it's unfolding? It's a huge challenge. Uh, it's not like World War II where there's, you know, Nazis to hate. Um, I mean, there's places like ExxonMobil, uh, which which are which are truly evil corporations, that, and they've acted very badly. But the climate change itself is not something you can look at and touch. 
right? And the and the and the effects you the, the positive things you do don't have immediate response. It's really hard, and it feels impossible. It feels like uh, what I'm doing doesn't help, and it feels like even if I do what I'm doing helps, it feels too big. So it's a real. It's probably the most challenging thing. It's for sure the most challenging thing that humankind has ever uh, made, and, and and we've made it. It's also one of the even more challenging for us to, to to figure out how to describe and to figure out how to fix. I'm overwhelmed by it. I'm humbled by it. And and yet we have to. Yeah, we have yeah. no choice. We have no choice. Right. And, uh, you know, Bill Gates is out there saying, you know, this is a huge thing and, you know, uh, you know, and he's finally coming around to it. Uh, Davis Guggenheim, you recently read Overstory. You said it was the best book you've read in, in 20 years. Um, tell us about the, why that book affected you so profoundly, what it might say about storytelling. I remember reading uh, um, Animal Farm in high school and going, oh my God, this is an incredible story. And it's about <laughs> capitalism and communism and socialism and humankind and classism and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and it was given to me over Christmas and I read it. It's, it's one of the most remarkable novels I've ever read in my life. It's about 10 or so characters that you don't think that they're related and they somehow become related. I'm not going to say too much. Uh, and it's not specifically an environmentalist story, but it, it fundamentally is. And it's about our disconnection from nature. And it made me realize that like as much as we can think in political terms, unless we really connect and reconnect to nature and find our balance within the world of other people, other tribes other, and, and, and nature, even if we solve the techno te technical aspects of climate change, we as a species are lost. It, it's such, I, I, um, I guarantee you, if you read this book, it's called Overstory by Richard Powers. It'll blow your mind. And, and, and it, it recharged me uh, in, in, a, in a sense. I'm going to put it higher in my pile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've heard about it. Uh, Celine, you mentioned how your sub film subjects have asked only that you, you take their stories and, and make them yours. How are stories you know, important in our culture and how can we do a better job uh, passing them along? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, let's not forget that we're all storytellers. I mean, the three of us are, are here, you know, talking about our, our work and our careers as storytellers, but we are all you're sitting around a fire with a beer. You're a storyteller coming home from holiday when we're allowed to go on holiday again. You're a storyteller because you come back, you, you come back with those, um, those moments and those memories. Um, I think, first of all, is to you know, own your own story, but share it with others. Listen to other people. Listen. We, I have had to relearn the art of listening because listening with indigenous people is more time consuming, is more proactive. You're, you're there as an active listener. You can't be thinking about how you're going to respond. You really need to be absorbing. Um, so I think those are, those are all skills um, to, to relearn and to remember. And I think going back to what, what Davis was saying as well is that we are, um, we, we are inherently um, all interconnected with this. We need to be present with it. There might not be tangible solutions, but it is about consciousness. It is about it is about that shift. And and unless we start reconnecting with nature, reconnecting with ourselves, and reconnecting with others, climate change is always going to mm. seem like this far away subject. Um, so I would say, just start and sit quietly, contemplate. Let's let's get off of these all the time. I'm just as guilty, and just spend a moment reflecting about our place on this planet and with each other. And I think then we're gonna start realizing what's truly important in our lives. And, and that's gonna start, I believe, uh, a tide shift in, um, in our relationship with our own future. We've been talking about visual storytelling with Celine Cousteau, Christina Miedermeyer, and Davis Guggenheim. There's another piece of uh, documentaries and uh, you know, song and, and music is an important part of, of these storytellings. You know, Melissa Etheridge wrote the theme song titled I Need to Wake Up, a roaring anthem about speaking up that's the theme for an inconvenient truth. When I returned from the Arctic for the first time in 2007, I assembled a slideshow, arranged that song, and I cried at my kitchen table for weeks putting it together. I still get mushy when I hear that song. And I think it's 
underappreciated. There's no enduring theme song for climate and the way we shall overcome as for civil rights or others. I think that song is as good as any. Um, uh, Davis Guggenheim is the person who put that together. I'm curious about how that song holds up. It's clearly more people know the music than the song, but I'm just curious in your thoughts about a plug for that song. I think it's powerful and it still holds up. It's a beautiful song. Uh, uh, it really is incredible and it captured a moment and a feeling that you, you, the theme of this show is um, visual storytelling. Well, this is how songwriting can help. And uh, it just shows you that it takes, it's going to take a lot of voices and a lot of different expressions, scientists, filmmakers, photographers, um, songwriters. It takes all of us. Can I, can I add something to that, Greg, if I may? Do you think, Davis, I mean, there was a moment when we started talking about climate change, when the conversation was truly cerebral. And I feel like in the beginning, at least, it left a lot of people out. You know, people don't like to feel stupid. And it's just when you start looking at those graphs, you're like, oh, I don't get what they're telling me. You know, I'm just going <laughs> to not think about it. But through song and through story and through photography, we lower the price of entry into the most important conversation of our lives. And like you said, Celine, we're all storytellers. And I feel that the stories that we're telling somehow are empowering people to feel included. And we're giving them permission to become environmentalists, you know, to care about this issue. We need many more. I, I, I agree 100%. And I also think we need to be conscious of how the how the, the, the urgency is changing. Like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we needed to convince people that it was real. And then we need to convince people it's, uh, that humans are causing it. <laughs> and then you wanna convince people that this is the most urgent story of our time. It keeps going, right? The story and the, 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 the barriers to understanding and taking full action keep shifting and understanding w where people are in this sto story and meeting them there, like you both are in your work, and uh, you know all this, uh, is, 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 is the thing I'm always trying to crack. That's why I'm going back to my son and that sort of weird disconnect between him making a life choice about having children and then not talking about it. It's like, okay, there's something there. I'm always mm -hmm. thinking of where are people in this, in this moment. And then there's and then there's something else because in the conversation about climate change, we often uh, don't talk about the biodiversity loss that's going with it, right? These two parallel things, and they're they're hand in hand. And the solution for a lot of climate change is going to be to protect biodiversity or to restore habitats. And so we can't leave that part of the conversation out and allow the Elon Musk's of the world to you know come up with a machine that solves the issue when we already have all the machinery on this planet that can solve the issue if only we choose to protect it. Yeah, I, agree. I, I think this conversation goes back. Uh, is that my video? Decisions yeah. to do things. Oh, did I cut out for a second? <laughs> you did, you did. You're back. So start back. from, you can restart, yeah. I, I think this brings us back to an earlier part of the conversation with my octopus teacher, where we're talking about the intellectual side of a conversation and the emotional side of a conversation. And that sometimes, Christina, to your point, that it seems out of reach. It seems untouchable. Oh, mm -hmm. I cut out again. Should I start over? <laughs> please. Yeah, why don't you start? Yeah, please. <laughs> I think this brings us back to an earlier part of the conversation with my octopus teacher, um, where there's an emotional side of the conversation and an intellectual side. And if we only focus on the intellectual side, then it does seem daunting and overwhelming to your point, Christina. I think if we focus on the emotional side, then, then we're leaving information out. But to the point of Davis and, and your son and his friends, they're reacting on an emotional level, not just on a logical level. I think all of that comes into play and it goes back to the psychology. So I think you're, you're right on Davis in this direction. The psychology of climate change, the psychology of understanding ourselves in this current time and space. What is at stake? Do we understand it? What are we willing to do about it without going to panic button? Panic button only leads to chaos, right? We know chaos doesn't solve anything. So can we move forward in a, in a thoughtful, meditative, calm way where we actually provide people with tangible solutions where they exist and not, not try to get them to solve the world? Because I had a friend who told me once, oh, I feel so good knowing you're out there 
protecting the planet. And I was like, time out. Hold on a second. Come on, check it. <laughs> protect check it. Selena's on it. <laughs> it's Tuesday. I'm good. <laughs> it's it, true. It, it's inclusive, which I think is beautiful, right? It's inclusive. It's like, no, come with me. I have beautiful things to show you, and you can do something about it. I think that's what we're all trying to do. Yeah, well, there's a lot of that, and, and a lot well said. And there's a lot in that language, global and planet. People can't grok global and planet, right? That's it's just too big and beyond them. And so some of the, you know, and people on the left use planet and global. People on the right use use a different frame, a different language. My own journey has been learning has been from the literally outer space, learning about climate and the systems and the physics and the politics and the oceans and everything else. And the biggest systemic problem is between our ears right here, this system that is preventing us from understanding the other systems. Um, and then from the head to the heart, I think that was well said, uh, all of you. It's been a pleasure to uh, to talk with all of you. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team making this happen, especially our technical director, Adam Anderson, who's been with the Climate One 10 years next month. Thank you, Adam. On Climate One today, we've been discussing the visual dimensions of the climate story and how the imagery of nature and glory and in peril impacts our personal motivation to act on climate disruption. My guests were Celine Cousteau, filmmaker and environmental activist. Her new film about indigenous communities in the Amazon is Tribes on the Edge, streaming now. And Christina Mittermeier is a photographer, conservationist, and marine biologist. She's co-founder of the nonprofit Sea Legacy. Davis Guggenheim, a filmmaker who directed and produced An Inconvenient Truth, which won an account Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature um, almost 15 years ago. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. We want to make sure.